What is up, everybody? Welcome back to the Debbie Rao YouTube channel. We're back with another edition of our Top 25 series, running through the Top 25 according to ESPN. Not us. Don't yell at us. We're on ESPN. And we're at a surprising one today, the Florida Gators. We're going to be talking about the Gators, Billy Napier squad, what they have in store for them this year. And we're going to be talking about kind of what happened last year in a season that had a lot of ups a lot of downs, um, finished off kind of stagnant. We're going to be talking about the recruiting trail. We go through the entire depth chart. We go through the roster. We go offense and defense, and we give you guys our full breakdown to get you ready for the 2023 season. Hang in there while the intro is going, and then we will be diving into the Gators. All right, let's get into Florida. Let's talk about them from last year. You know, Billy Napier came over, taking over for Dan Mullen. And, you know, to say that Florida was down, I don't think so. I think they had a lot of talent last year. I didn't think they performed what they needed to do. Six and seven last year, uh, you know, points per game. They're 57th in the country, which is surprising given the take that they have Anthony Richardson at quarterback, who was a top five pick. Billy Napier's coming over. Like, that should have been better, right? Points against, they were not very good there. 87th against points against. They struggled defensively and offensively last year overall. Um, and, and I think that's something to know. And I think they definitely underperformed last year. And when you're thinking of, like, historical you know significance of this season you know they haven't had you know when you're looking at losses um a losing season since 1978 1979 so that was a big one um and even pushing it back there like they haven't lost three to had three straight losing seasons in the since the 50s so we're talking about a very important year coming up um didn't do very good in terms of that offensively and defensively but there is, I don't know, there's room for optimism a little bit. I think on the defensive side of the ball, they were uh, they were the worst against at, at, on third down. So, hey, maybe they sure that up a little bit, right? So, SEC opponents were converting about 49% of the time, um, 30 points and six losses. So, yeah, maybe that's the case. But there is room for optimism, maybe. So, let's get into that. Um, and, and actually, the first room that has some optimism actually is that offensive line. So, what are we talking about, Christian? Yeah, a couple of uh, returning starters, but Richie Leonard the fourth played over 200 snaps. So you've got pretty much three returning starters, but they're really excited about the two transfers. Michael Mascua um, coming over from Baylor played really well last year. Kianta Goodwin, Goodwin uh, came transfer from Kentucky, former five star kid. Really didn't get to play last year. Uh, jump ship over. I mean, a five star kid that's been compared to Orlando Brown. Like this is an NFL player probably. And then Austin Barber played really well for them last year. So I think, you know, Egwakun needs to take a step forward. I think Richie Leonard could stand to take a step forward as well. They lose Osiris Torrance. I think that's the big one, right? Like that was yeah. the the guy that, that kind of held that, at least that rushing attack together last year. But overall, this unit is, I think, better than what they rolled out for most of last year. Yeah, and, and to, to his point and to the credit of the 247 sports reporters I've been diving into, they said, hey, they actually look improved up front. And if this if this team can gel and these guys can gel there, first, that's what you need. If you want to have a better season than you did last year, gel up front. Okay, then let's look at this because it does go well with the running, the running back room. Like when you're looking at overall, I think the one thing that stands out to the Gators is that they their running backs are solid. When you're looking at just that room, Montrell, Trevor Etienne, even Cameron Carroll, um, Trevor Webb as well, but those two guys up top. Montreal and Trevor are, are really your one-two punch in college football. And, and they can rival a lot of SEC teams in terms of that. That one-two punch is in there. The other, then you get into a lot of question marks. Quarterback room, where Graham Mertz is there. He transferred from Wisconsin. Um, Jack Miller as well. Max Brown. Wide receivers, you got a ton of losses in there in terms of what left. Who's there? Probably Ricky Purcell and Eugene Wilson, to be honest. I love Eugene Wilson. I think he's a, he's a playmaker. playmaker. He's a true freshman coming in there. But a lot of question marks overall on this offense for, you know, a lot of people say, hey, they're going to take that next step this year. Um, Napier has a history on his side, though. Like when you're looking at his offenses, they usually do. They saw his offense at Louisiana jump six points per game to almost 40 points per game. So a lot of people are kind of saying, oh, well, if he did that at, you know, Louisiana, he's going to do that at Florida with the talent. I think it all hinges on that quarterback room, though. Yeah, I think that's, you know, there's reason for optimism, but going from Anthony Richardson to Graham Mertz, especially within this offensive atta attack, is kind of interesting. You know, like very separate uh, styles of play. I think Graham Mertz, you know, we talked about it on the, the Wisconsin episode, but I think there were times that he showed that there's like a good quarterback somewhere in him. 
I just don't think that he's ever had a an offense that maximizes his talent. Yeah. I do have faith that Napier can kind of do that. Um, but you're right. I think everything revolves around this running back room. I love Montreal Johnson. I wasn't huge on ETN until I saw him play a little bit last yeah. year. You know, I, I wasn't huge on his high school film, but he was good last year. And I, you know, I really like Trayon Webb coming in as well. So I think when you look at this rushing attack, when you combine that with the offensive line, I think this is going to be an improved offense. Maybe the quarterback play isn't as good in the highs, but maybe the floor is a little bit higher too, where Richardson had some pretty rough stretches. I think if you get improved play from your pass catchers, Richardson Mm -hmm. plays a lot better last year, and I hope that they'll do that here for Mertz this year. Yeah, I think the scenario is with his offense is they're going to have to lean on their rushing attack, you know, and, and an offensive line in jail. And then Mertz just can't make mistakes and just kind of just be fluid, find Ricky Purcell, who who was good last year, um, and, and kind of do that. But again, in this in the SEC, with the way offenses are going, you got to score a lot. Tennessee, these teams that are going to be in there, Georgia, um, you have to go score. And that's that's the question, I think. That is the overarching theme with this, with this program, with this offense right now, especially because what they lost last year. Anthony Richardson, we all know. Um, um, and, and he got drafted based on upside. But again, you have Anthony Richardson there. It's in, in, in that offense. Why couldn't Napier do something with it? I think that's the biggest thing. And I think you you hit it on the head with the, the wide receivers and everything there. But it just seemed out of flux last year. They beat Utah at the first game of the year, and that was a great game. I got I got uh, Christian over here on the hype trade for Richardson after the first game. But then you lose the Vanderbilt. You can't lose the Vanderbilt in the SEC. Like, you can't do those things. So that's when you talk about the inconsistencies. Sirens Torrance, Ethan White, Justin Shorter, who was in college football, I felt like, 10 years. And then Xavier Henderson, who I, I – man, Xavier, to me, I was a big fan of Xavier when he came out. He just was inconsistent. And I, I think it was time for this program to move on from just each other. Like, I just don't think it was going to work out there. Um, but, yeah, these are some big losses here. What do you think about just – overall like this passing attack of last year just inconsistency from the wide receivers is that basically what we're going to blame yeah i mean i think there's also something to be said about anthony richardson's uh ankle injury too yeah. because i think that there were there were signs that they wanted to do more with him as a runner but after that injury he chose not to run quite a bit and so i think they stopped calling those like you know rpos or, or just read option stuff um, quite a bit down the stretch because I don't, I just don't think that he was very healthy down the stretch. Now, why he wasn't healthy, that offensive line didn't perform. It goes back to that. But, you know, notable losses, Justin Shorter, Xavier Henderson. I, you know, I don't know how, I doubt Florida fans think they're notable. I, I think they're excited to see this new regime of wide receivers in here that can actually maybe catch the ball. I go back to a Florida State game maybe where there were like 10 drop passes in that game alone, and, and it wasn't yeah. all shorter in Henderson because I don't think they were out there that game, but it was just a, a ton of inconsistency in that wide receiver room. So, you know, notable by name, but I think Florida fans aren't too upset about some of these guys leaving. Yeah, no, 100%. When you look at the recruits, hey, he, he, one thing that I will say is that they are doing a good job on that recruiting trail. 13th overall in the composite rank for the overall. This is their offensive side. I have to give a shout out. We got to talk. Jacob LaFrance, he's the director of player personnel there. I, every time I look up their recruiting, I hear that name. And they're saying, hey, doing a great job. And obviously, they dropped the ball on Jaden Rashada, whatever happened there in terms of that, that recruit. I think that was... That's something that they dealt with, but they have bounced back in the 24 class as well. When you're looking at this 23 class from an offensive perspective, Aiden Mizell, I think he's a very good wide receiver when you're looking at him, 26 overall in the class. Eugene Wilson is a smaller receiver, but you know he popped off. Before last year, he was not in the top 100. Now he's wide receiver 16, and, and that is someone that – the next step evolution of this offense, right? And I think people were really excited when they have a shot of coming, but now that they don't, hey, it's okay. Now you have that weapon. Go get that quarterback with whoever you think that is. Roger Kearney as well. So there, um, I like Webb. I've watched a lot of his tape. I think that he fits well in this offense. This is a really good offensive scheme. Like mm-hmm. this is that pick there. I love that. Then he went after those, you know, obviously those interior offensive linemen. Caden Jones, he kind of filled it out. I really like this class for them. I thought this was a very good first class in terms of having a full cycle going. Um, but overall, I thought they did a good job of filling holes. Had Rashad been here, yeah, now we're talking about a legitimate, like, wow, this class is amazing. But again, he's got a quarterback coming next year. We have those pieces coming. Um, and you can see, you have to be in the top 15 of recruiting classes to compete, and he's doing that. 
Yeah, he's done a fantastic job. I even like Andy Jean a little bit. Um, yeah. You know, so I think he, he, they got three receivers that I think are part of a, a big part of their plans. And I, like you said, Eugene probably is one of those guys that gets on the field early. I think Aiden Mazel probably works his way on towards the end of the year. I think that's more of a gradual thing. Um, but Eugene's one of those guys that I think can come in. Maybe Purcell takes an outside like Z type of role and Wilson can kind of cook in the slot, which I think, you know, when we talked about Graham Mertz, I think that that's one yeah. thing that he will do a little bit better than than Richardson even is is kind of push the ball, um, not downfield necessarily, but in those intermediates. Uh, there were times where Richardson did it well. This is a pro Richardson podcast. Anything that I say about Richardson, <laughs> everyone has to know that I, I love him. But yeah, I mean, this class to me, Trayon Webb was one of the, the best few running backs in the class. I, I evaluated him as such. So uh, I'm, you know, pretty ecstatic for what they're kind of doing. You can tell that last year was kind of that, okay, this is the building year. This is what we're trying to build identity wise. And then he went and got guys that fit that really well. So I, I think he's doing a fantastic job there. Hey, and, and they went out and got Florida. They have 14 dudes from Florida and even in Georgia, they got a couple guys from Georgia as well. And if you're going to do that, that's how you're going to have to build this, especially because you're competing against Georgia right now for recruits. And then, and you're also competing against Tennessee for every wide receiver recruit in the nation. So you gotta, <laughs> you gotta go out there. You gotta get those dudes. And, and just to talk about the transfers, I thought they did well in the transfer portal. You could see where they fill. We talked about these guys all already. The uh, interior offensive lineman tackles um, and in grammar, Hurts and Cam Carroll. I like Cam Carroll. I always thought he was pretty good at Tulane when you're talking about him as a runner. Um, I, I will say this about Mertz. While I have my question marks about him, I will say he's never thrown a guy's, even in this wide receiver room, that Wisconsin didn't have this level of talent. And I know I get maybe Wisconsin fans a little mad at me there, but the, these recruits are, you know, historically are going to be a little higher at Florida than they were at Wisconsin. So if he does do that, and, and it is said that in the spring, he picked up this offense really well. I don't know about the spring game. The spring game looked really bad. Now, I try not to take anything away from the spring game. We have people out there saying Florida's going to go, you know, win a game or whatever the case may be. Um, but it was said in practice, Graham picked up this offense really well, and they were happy with him. They didn't really necessarily go out and get anybody in the portal when they could have when it opened. So that gives me some like, okay, maybe they are happy with Mertz rolling around. Yeah, and, I, you know, I think that also speaks to their comfortability with Jack Miller as their backup yeah. um, because I do think that – I think, you know, we have that as the, the position battle. I do think that that's still an open battle. I think Mertz has pretty much won it by this point. I don't think he transfers there if he doesn't think he's going to win it. But we've seen this happen in the past where guys just transfer in and then they just kind of get outplayed. I do think they like Miller being there. Um, you know, I, I do like how they attacked tackle depth as well. You know, they went out and got two starters for their offensive line, but they needed some depth behind it. And I, I think they did a good job. Uh, in the transfer portal. It's, this is one of those rare times I talked about it on the last video, but it's rare that you see uh, teams going hard in recruiting and then attacking the portal the way that, that Florida did. And, you know, I think it was necessary after a losing season, but I think they did a fantastic job. Yeah, they did. All right, let's get over to impact players and we'll jump over to the defense. Graham Mertz, all the running backs. Yeah, the freshman wide receiver is going to be in there as well. Um, I, you know, the running backs to me are the big thing. One, two punch, get that, you know, keep that defense off the field. Um, kind of, you know, old school kind of big 10 ish, you know, a little bit like, hey, big plays, yes, but hey, let's dominate up front and not make let if Graham Mertz has to win you a bunch of games, I think you're gonna be in trouble. But if you can control a bunch of these games and and you have those running backs there, Montreal and Trevor Etienne are two of the best duos that I know in the SEC they are they are solid and they play well off of each other i thought mantra looked really good last year at times i thought he was inconsistent a little bit um but at times he looked like one of the best running backs in college football so if they have both those guys back there then we'll be okay yeah there's a big conversation about running backs happening right now and and i put out a tweet about how you know really good schemes can just take advantage of whatever talents there but when you have dudes that can you know play in that scheme like Florida does right now uh, it just makes that offense so much better and so Napier is a fantastic play designer I think his offense is very creative but those running backs have to you know continue to take that yeah. step forward they're going to kind of carry this offense um, and you know I'm excited to watch this offense I, I think that it's going to be better than most project simply because like I said I think that floor is a bit higher this year even if the ceiling might not be as high I I'm I think they're on on the right track here all right, let's go over to the defense. So one thing I will say, just to kind of reiterate it, they had one of the worst defenses last year that they've had in the program for a little while. Like when you're looking at overall, like I said, they allowed opponents to convert, you know, 49% of their third downs. 
30 points and six losses, losing to Vanderbilt. There's a lot of things on this. And in the awful Oregon State game, which, you know, a lot of guys checked out at that point and quit. But you don't necessarily like to see that from a first-year coach in a bowl game. That You know, it, that that's tough. They, You know, when you're looking at this, Patrick Tony left, their defensive coordinator, and then you hire 29-year-old Austin Armstrong to be his defensive coordinator, too. So we're talking about young, youthful energy in there. What do we notice about this defense, and can they kind of step up and come back a little bit? Well, I think a lot of their guys left, and I think that's kind of a, a, a main piece here is that, you know, some of those guys that might have been checked out have kind of left the program. Yes. They brought in uh, quite a few guys, but, you know, the the returning player, I think, that we'll highlight is Princely Uman Mielin. Um, I think, you know, when you look at pressures and, and, you know, getting to the quarterback, this is the guy, right? This is the guy that's going to make this defense go uh, in terms of pass rush. I think they've improved in certain areas, but, you know, returning, I talk about consistency and continuity from year to year. I think in this case, the the turnover is a good thing. I think getting some new blood in there, I, I Napier inherited most of those guys. Uh, a lot of those guys were juniors, seniors. They're in the NFL now. Um, you know, I, I think that getting a new group in here and kind of having this group buy into what they're trying to do, I yeah. think that that's a good thing for them this year. Yeah, we've seen that. So when you talk about the losses, you got Trey Dean, Amari Bernie, um, Gervin Dexter, Rashad Torrance, Ventral Miller, um, Britton Cox Jr. They lost some guys. But again, this is an addition by subtraction, I think, sometimes. Like, hey, getting some guys in there that, you know, are going to fit your fit your system, but fit your fit your philosophy. Like, I like Dexter. I thought Dexter, you know, I thought inconsistent at times, but I did like him. Um, Rashad Torrance, you know, I liked him as well. But nothing here stands out to me as like, oh, my gosh, you can't overcome this, especially with the transfers they got in. Yeah, to me, this is the the hall of underperforming players for yeah. Florida. Uh, Dexter, to me, like kid loaded with potential, but there's a reason he went in the third round. Uh, you know, Ventral Miller was a, a draft community favorite, and he just he just never played up to what I think his potential was. And I think you can say that about most of the guys on this list here. Brenton Cox had a ton of stuff happen throughout his career, but yeah, um, yeah, I just. This is one of those things where they're notable, but by name, I think we can say that about both sides yeah. of the ball where Florida fans probably aren't too upset about most of these guys. Leaving. Yeah, 100%. Let's get into the recruits because I thought they did a really good job on this side. Um, you know, Kelby Collins is a, is a dude uh, just going through and looking at him. Um, position was number seven DL in the, in, in the country from Alabama, too. So they went in Alabama and they, and they took this kid. Um, I like him, 6'4", 265. He's a big kid. Jakeem Jackson, as well, from Florida, cornerback, um, number four, four in his in his position. Um, going through here as well, Dijon Johnson, um, Cameron James, Jordan Castle, Sharif Denson, and you'll see four stars about like they really attacked that position i think for me my favorite pickup for them was kelby collins i think he can sure up that defensive line somewhere where they really need and i think that he's someone that can maybe get in there this year rotational wise like he's already got the size and the frame and we've been talking about these guys for a while these teams and this breakdowns when you have a guy that can do that you have that kind of depth and that freshman that can come in and be an impact player we see that all the time at lsu and some of these bigger programs if florida can do that too i mean there are a bigger program but get back to it i think that that'll help them in the long run yeah for sure i mean to me this group i i like jakeem jackson i think that that was a really nice pickup yeah. for them when i when i think of florida defenses i think of you know long athletic corners that traditionally go high in in the nfl draft <laughs> i think jakeem jackson has that upside um you know and just watching some of his highlights and, and some of his play in high school but yeah overall once again, you know, you look at the offensive side of the ball, sometimes you'll see teams, maybe not programs with as much pedigree as, as Florida, but they attack one side of the ball really well and then they kind of slack on the other side. That is not the case this year. They really went out and and got guys, got dudes on both sides of the ball that I think, you know, maybe they don't have to play this year, but maybe they do come in and play. Maybe that elevates this defense to be, a, you know, a step above even what we've discussed is that, addition by subtraction this yeah. would be the addition by addition you know yeah 100 percent. and in, hey let's talk about some other additions we have mitchell on here cam jackson caleb banks and rj moden i want to talk about cam jackson this kid is massive 6'6 <laughs> uh, 340 from memphis uh man he's a big kid redshirt sophomore too so when we're thinking of like hey can really kind of set, set that tone and maybe be there more than just a year um last year he started all 13 games he totaled 41 tackles two and a half tackles for loss a sack uh 
four quarterback hurry. So he was in it. Um, and when you look at that, we're looking at that and he talked about against Navy against a heavy run offense had eight stops in terms of what they were trying to do in that on the offense, five tackles, a tackle for loss at SMU. And you just look at it. He had a really good bowl game um, and he is a stud. Like he is going to solidify that front line to me um, in that defensive line. And, and I think that that sets the tone for these guys. And if, if he can stay, if they, if he does say he doesn't declare for the NFL draft, if he stays another year, they're building towards something. And it's something a little special. So like, I thought Cam Jackson was an amazing pickup by this coaching staff. I think he's a better scheme fit than Dexter was yeah. too. Uh, I think, you know, they asked Dexter to play a role like Cam Jackson played. And I don't think that that was necessarily his strength. He was kind of more of a, a three tech type of guy that was playing one tech because he kind of had to with where yeah. that defense was. Uh, <clears throat> but Cam Jackson to me is like probably an upgrade for that, that defensive uh, line. Taraja Mitchell is a guy that everyone is really excited for. Um, we'll talk about him and the impact players here too, but uh, this is a guy that he transfers from over uh, Ohio state, just didn't get to play. Um, and he has stood out in the spring from everything we've heard. I think that that's one of those, uh, you know, further upgrades in that linebacker room. And they went out to the portal and got probably upgrades at, three positions here yes. um because i don't think their safety has played up to to snuff last year either so i think you know they like rj moton coming in too so uh, i think they did a it was very calculated in in the positions that they attacked they went out they filled needs and i think a lot of these guys are going to get on the field very very early yeah, and not that you know, Caleb Banks is also six six three twenty three. Like he's a big boy too. So they, they they filled that. They filled it good. Um, impact players there: Mitchell, Princely, and Boone. Um, I know you want to talk about Mitchell. Go ahead. What, what do we got for Mitchell? What do you expect from him? Yeah, to me, so like when you looked at what Ventro Miller did in the middle of that that defense, there were the flashes of really good coverage play, but the ability to kind of go sideline to sideline with range. Yeah. Taraja Mitchell has all of it. He's got the total package now. I think a lot of what we're betting on is a bit of upside with him um, and and him coming in and being that starting linebacker, middle linebacker is certainly a tall task in this defense. But if you've got those improvements on the defensive line, if you've got Princely that's able to kind of get to the quarterback, I think that's going to take some attention away. I think Mitchell can probably get to the quarterback a bit this year. I think that's a, a very, very good pickup, and that's going to be the driving force. You know, those two to me are the guys, Princely and Taraja, that, are going to make this defense go. So I love the pickup. I think he's an impact player from day one. Yeah, and then a couple other guys, just a note real quick. Sophomore linebacker Shamir James is still there, so he had 47 stops last year, and that was among probably the best of the returning guys. And then cornerback Jason Marshall Jr., like he's a third-year kid. They need him to really step up in that uh, in that secondary for them. Um, they have talked about, like we talked about with the recruiting, Jakeem Jackson maybe getting in there, get a little bit of run in that secondary as well. Um, so those guys got to step up. So we, I think what we're mentioning is the defense is going to be a little younger, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be worse. I think that they could actually get a – I think they have better scheme fit now i think they were looking and seeing okay what guys fit here um but you should be excited if you're florida fans i think that this is a better defense i mean it, it, it can't really get worse but i do think that it can get definitely top in better because they need to when you're looking at the schedule and what's coming on there this is not an easy schedule at Utah, first game of the year, and you know the Utes are going to be just ready, roaring to go. They don't lose a lot in Utah. I don't know if you guys know that. They just don't <laughs> use a lot at Utah, especially in the back 12 but they just don't do that. I think the tone is set that first game. If Florida can come out and beat Utah at Utah, I think that's something. I think it's something to get in there because they can go 2-0 and against Tennessee. They got to stop that offense. And if Joe Milton in that offense, what is that going to look like? you got to get after him. you got to make him make mistakes. Then you have Charlotte, Kentucky. You know They need to beat Kentucky. They better beat Vanderbilt when you're looking at it at South Carolina, Georgia, obviously Arkansas, LSU, Missouri, and Florida state. This is a, this is a tough freaking schedule when you're looking at overall and what they're at. What do you think of this schedule? The final six games are all losable, um, yeah. which is problematic, man. It's Missouri is a good football team. Missouri took Georgia down to the, to the wire yeah. last year. And I, I think they're a better football team than, and many give them credit for Florida state, you know, their their national championship talks there. I think you're right. I think the Utah game is going to set the tone for the year. I think on some level, this Tennessee offense is going to peter out a little bit. You know, I think Hendon Hooker ran it really well last year. We've talked about this, but I'm not convinced that Joe Milton is going to operate it as efficiently. And so I think that when you've got athletes on the field, like Florida is going to have, 
I think that's an opportunity to go snag a win against Tennessee. It's in Florida. I think they're feeling good about that. If they win the first three, I think they're walking into South Carolina undefeated. And I think that that's a big matchup ahead of Georgia. I think they have the capability of beating South Carolina, but I also think South Carolina is a good football team. So they could be 7-0 and going into Georgia, which would already be an improvement from last year. So I yeah. think you're feeling good about it as a Florida fan, but also know that that back half of the schedule is tough. It's really, really tough. It's tough. And, and I think if you if you beat Utah, I think you hit your over at five and a half, which is their over. I think you hit six if you beat Utah. If you don't beat Utah, I have a hard time being like, yeah, you're going to hit that six because I think it takes a, a little bit more there. I think it just depends on that Tennessee game, too. I think those those first three games are really good. I mean, McNeese State, you should beat them. But if you're looking at that, like if they can come out of that two and one or three, and zero, like you mentioned, yeah, then then Florida can kind of miss that that losing streak that for the third straight year if not if they if they lose those two, if they go zero and three or and two or one and two i think napier could be on a hot seat i i really do like he wasn't left with them you know the cupboard baron like dan mullen was a good coach he had guys there so i i don't think that we're talking about a full rebuild this isn't like a colorado this isn't one something that we're seeing out there um so i i, I agree i think so too i think at five and a half i would take i have a hard time i i, I want to say over i have a hard time seeing him get under that it's going to be close though i wouldn't bet this but if i had to pick i think six wins is their base it's funny because when we put together the manifesto i looked at their over under and i said mm, i don't want to put that one in the manifesto because i'm yeah. not certain uh so instead I, I said exact season wins of five just because of the odds i don't think they're actually going to hit five but then conference wins are the ones so their conference win line is three and a half so what that's implying is that they're only going to get two wins um, outside of conference and they play McNeese state and Charlotte. And those are the two, right? So, yeah, cause your other, well, Utah and Florida state are the other out of conference games that are really, really tough. So um, yeah, man, I just, I feel like everything comes down to can those running backs carry this offense? Can Graham Mertz, you know, minimize mistakes? Because I think if that's the case, I think they do hit the over. I think Napier is building something good. Maybe the results are 2024, uh, more, uh, more yeah. 2024 than 2023. But yeah, I, I think as a Florida fan, you've still got to be pretty excited about where the program's headed. I, I think so. I think if they can turn this ship around, I think the I, I think they have a chance. I, I'm not going out of the spring game, so I'm not talking about the spring game. I know the spring game was one of those ones, but they have DJ Lagway coming next year, four star quarterback. Like, and they have one of the best recruiting classes in the country next year. They have a three, a three overall. So if that's the case, then go. You know, that's something to hang your head. And I hear a lot of naysayers say, "Well, some guys might decommit if they win five games, maybe, but not all of them. They're not all going to do that. So if they can still get a top ten class, you're still talking about building a building the program, which which they need to do. And I think Florida needs to let this kind of play out a little bit and not just get rid of their head coach. So appreciate you guys hit that like and subscribe button. Let us know in the comments. What do you guys think? Can they hit that over? We'll be back again with our next team next time. Until then, we'll see you guys later.